Nah, we don't need the notes. We ran through it. All right, it is 1 o'clock now. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for coming here today and being with us. Hope you're having a good WordCamp so far. Um, we are going to talk about tackling Gutenberg and NC State, uh, the Blockenspiel. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have a mic. I will talk louder. Thanks for reminding me. Um, my name is Miles Elliott, and this is... Lauren Etheridge. And, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about tackling Gutenberg development at NC State. Um, if you want to follow along with these slides, uh, there's a website link at go.ncsu.edu slash block and spiel. I, I do not have a mic hooked up. She has a mic. There's only one mic. There's two of us, one mic. Um, she can say it louder if, if you can't hear me. But yes, do let me know if I talk, start talking too quietly. Um, anyway, so um, Lauren and I are both part of the um, Office of Information Technology Design and Web Services team. Um, which is uh, myself and Lauren, as well as Jen McFarland and Brian DeConnick, who are here as well today. Woo! Um, if you want to hear more about us, uh, you can go to design.oit.ncsu.edu, and that's got stuff more about stuff what we do. Um, other, we write blog posts occasionally. Um, you can laugh at us for being silly. Um, good stuff like that. Um, now, so about us, uh, we are housed in the central IT office and part of the outreach communications and consulting department, uh, which means that we uh, interact with campus more than the rest of Central IT. We provide resources um, as well as um, general help to campus. Um, we manage several major WordPress multi-sites, including like a free blogs environment. Um, we work with a number of clients um, on campus and build, building uh, custom WordPress themes, custom WordPress plugins, and doing maintenance for them. Um, but that's elective um, clients. People on campus don't have to use us. They make the choice to use us. And so there are a lot of departments that may have their own um, IT staff, especially the larger colleges, College of Engineering, um, have their own IT staff. So um, there's a lot of stuff that may be happening in WordPress around campus that we don't know about. If they run into problems, they may come ask us. But there's stuff out there that's outside our purview. Um, and we also do training across campus for um, WordPress in general and, um, well, now Gutenberg. Um, so in Gutenberg development, step one is learning. Um, so Guten what now? <laughs> um, we knew that Gutenberg has been coming for a while. Uh, Matt Mullenweg said it at WordCamp US a couple years ago, like learn JavaScript deeply. And then they're saying, oh, we're going to make a new thing. Um, and so it had been on our radar that there was a change coming. But change in WordPress happens slowly. It's, it's not, it, you know, we've never seen a revolutionary change like this. And we figured this might be some of the same. Um, and like you could download the Gutenberg editor and play with it um, maybe like a year, like last year in the summer. But we, I, don't, I didn't try it then. I don't, I don't know if anybody else did. Um, but it wasn't until our colleague Brian went to WordCamp US in November of last year um, and uh, sort of saw several talks about how big Gutenberg was going to be and you know, the change that it would engender in the ecosystem that we were kind of freaked out that this is going to be a huge thing and we had to get started because this meant um, big things. Um, so it, it really was going to be a change in the ecosystem. Um, once we really started playing around with it, we realized that um, probably we were going to have to rewrite some of our stuff. A lot of our themes might need to be rewritten. Um, we were going to be writing a lot more JavaScript, which didn't really feature heavily in our development process um, before now. Um, and we were going to be able to do um, a lot of cool things, even though um, it might felt uh, kind of like that. Uh, we were still excited about the cool things, um, but it was definitely a, a scary thing for us. Um, but we're going to go from sitting in a darkened room writing on dusty paper with our quills and pens to cranking out Bibles by the truckload with our fancy presses. Um, so that's, that's Gutenberg. He invented the printing press. They named it after him. Um, so turn it over to Lauren. So in thinking about our Gutenberg development, can everyone hear me? OK, good. Um, we wanted to make sure we had the right tools for the job and to sort of assess the skills of our team. Um, Miles had used React before, but he was really interested in doing it. He incorporated it into um, this project. Um, I had used React at a previous job and some of my freelance work. Um, ben, or Brian, why did I just do that? Ben, Jen. Ben, Jen, just rolled up with Brian and Jen um, had a little exposure, but hadn't really incorporated it into any projects yet. Um, testing was also relatively new to our process. We were talking about it, but we hadn't really done it. Um, we had maybe used Webpack on some one-off project, but weren't, we weren't really using it. Um, so with that team, well, let's pull our resources and figure out um, where our knowledge base starts and where it ends, and you know, it's kind of 
spread well. So we had to arrange a lot of intra-team meetings, which was the four of us, and kind of figure out where we were with respect to the Gutenberg development. Um, we gave a lot of smaller presentations. Um, Miles gave a crash course in React to all of us and tried to talk to us about how React will, how it works with Gutenberg. Um, and also, some team members took on a lot more work um, to help some of us get down to Gutenberg development. And let's see, so in planning, we needed to think about going the wrong way. Um, the way things are on campus. Um, so we have a huge university. There are roughly 32,000 students um, and about 8,000 staff and faculty. And across that, we were thinking about how is the web used across campus. So with that, we have some major campus multi-sites, which our team, OIT Design, manages. We have a free blog environment. And basically, that's anyone with um, NCSU ID can sign up and have a WordPress site. We also have some community posted environments where um, clients Usually departments or maybe student organizations pay us and we do a little bit more. Maybe we'll do some custom development or we will do some maintenance and we'll help them maintain their site. Um, and then we have some unit level multi-sites which include um, major departments like the HR department, the Department of Student Affairs, things like that. And then we have a whole truckload of single installs of WordPress and standalone sites and the rest of campus who knows what they're doing? <laughs> Why do we keep doing it? <laughs> so, in keeping up with that, um, this is how we do it as an OIT design. We have um, our development relies on um, the NC State shortcode short plugin, which Brian developed, and it's basically a plugin that helps deliver and empower clients to make fancy page level elements on. Um, their website and it's used heavily with our clients many other people who find out about it request it through our ticketing service and we will add it for them we also have some of the things on campus that rely heavily on advanced custom fields I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it the whole time <laughs> don't worry about it um, so with that, a further breakdown, um, Hillsboro is our primary theme, um, and it uses short codes. And we also maintain another theme called Polton, and it uses short codes and ACF. Other campus is using some combination of short codes, ACF page builders. We also have a lot of vendor-made sites, which are outside vendors, outside of NC State, um, and it relies on one of those three, and again, who knows what else is going on? Maybe an elephant or a giraffe or something is making sense. <laughs> We're not sure. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so we are four people, um, which may seem like a pretty big team, but it's not when you think about how large the campus is. Um, we're not formally trained in web development. Um, we have a wide range of skills. Between the four of us, we have a degree in graphic design, we have a degree in social work, and philosophy, mathematics, and technical communications. So there's a huge range of skill. But what stretches across all of us is the ability to problem solve and critical and analytical thinking. And those are some of the skills that help you the most in web development. Um, let's see. We work in the central IT office, which is to say, we have some power, but not really. <laughs> it's really like an illusion of power. Um, we can't really dictate anything or really make any rules. Um, but we do um, provide resources to campus in the form of trainings, tutorials. We do video tutorials. We make blog posts about what we're doing and how we do it. Yes, yeah, so I went the right way. Um, so, um, we knew we were a bit ahead of the curve in knowing about Gutenberg and wanting to work with it, um, and, but we wanted to make sure our fellow um, developers on campus knew about it too and were excited as much as we were and to 
get ready to gear up with development with us. It sort of made us feel like, go! <laughs> 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 oh, nailing it. All right. <laughs> So uh, part of this process of planning is sort of looking at our current development stack and thinking about how we, um, what we're doing and how we can sort of break that down and determine um, sort of what we have going on, what's working well, and what could be fixed. Um, so we use a, a campus built plugin that relies on GitHub to distribute um, uh, themes and plugins across campus. Shout out to Matt Fields, who developed it, who's in this room now, a celebrity among us. Um, and then, uh, so, so that's good. We use GitHub pretty heavily um, to distribute themes easily. Um, we use SAS a lot um, for compiling um, our CSS, and that's pretty much the only thing we've been using, like on the command line. Um, a lot of times we don't even have like a package JSON file with those commands. We're just running Node um, SAS to compile that straight from the command line. Um, we haven't really been doing much in the way of testing. We've been talking about it, but it's not part of our standard process. Um, and so also we don't really have like standardized development environments that we use. Um, like I use VS Code. Lauren, what do you use? I use VS Code sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, and then you know we have other people using Sublime, and so we're not really centralized around a common um, development process. We might be using different tools, and so sometimes you know I might be used to using a thing that somebody else might not have in the team. Um, and then also, you know, the way things are, sometimes we need to fix things quickly. You know, when with PHP, you can just kind of jump into a live server and make those fixes and change things, um, which is you know fun sometimes, but it can also present problems if something's done on the cPanel live environment, but is not done in the source. Um, and so it's a bad habit, but we do it because we're human. Um, so yeah, but let's take that stack and bring it down. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, that's where we're at now, uh, tearing it down. Um, and so uh, and, and, and part of that process also is looking at the things we like. Um, so life is too short to code. Um, so we use our short codes plugin pretty, heaven, uh, pretty heavily. Um, it is heavenly. Uh, it was developed by, uh, by our colleague Brian, who actually gave a talk on it last year here at WordCamp. So you may have seen that presentation if you were here. Um, but it works together with another plugin called Shortcake, which lets clients get a live preview of what that's going to look like um, in inside their editor, which makes it pretty easy for them to build those more rich layouts. And so that's been a thing that's super helpful for our team um, to be able to have um, those tools for our clients. And we can use it as well to quickly build out layouts without having to build those custom every time. Um, so that's, we're really looking at that as like a cornerstone of the way we're building sites and interacting with campus, providing that for them. And so that was sort of a key thing we were looking at as we were moving forward. Um, so uh, there are great things to come. Uh, we, we know we like some of the tools we have, um, but there's some issues presented by our development stack as well. It's, you know, we're a little bit fractured. We're not centralized around anything. Um, we use like a lot of disparate things. Um, some of you in this room are our clients and know that we have a variety of plugins. We like sometimes will run into like three different forms plugins on a site. And so there's some inconsistencies. And so Gutenberg does sort of present this moment of chaos and destruction. And so as everything collapses in on itself and chaos reigns, uh, we have an opportunity to rise from the ashes like a phoenix. Um, so we're really looking forward to this as sort of it's going to be a hectic next six months for us as WordPress continues development. And we get closer towards the actual launch of Gutenberg. Uh, it, it's it's going to be chaotic, but also it's exciting for what we can build um, anew. Um, so we really decided we wanted to mimic that shortcodes plugin with a blocks plugin, um, and we can use that to get buy-in from other developers on campus and have everyone sort of contribute to that. So we're all working from a shared basis. Uh, we're all improving the same thing. There's less duplication of efforts across different teams, and um, everyone will have a great time. And sort of generally, a uh, rising tide lifts all boats of NC State websites um, with our Gutenberg development. Um, so a quick detour, um, Gutenberg uses React under the hood to render its user interface. And for those of you who don't know, React is a JavaScript library that allows you to define these components that you can pass data to. And that end up, uh, determines what HTML is output on the screen. Um, and so that's um, a pretty interesting UI library. It makes it easier to, to work with um, HTML with JavaScript. Um, and then there's another talk that's focused entirely on making Guten block, so I'm not going to go into that. But suffice to say that it happens mostly inside of JavaScript. Um, you have a JavaScript function that registers the block, and you need to enqueue that JavaScript with PHP, um, and then whatever CSS you're using to style that block. Um, but PHP doesn't really do much in terms of um, you know, actually making the blocks. It's all pretty much in JavaScript. 
You can set for dynamic blocks, but that's a separate thing. Um, and then when you're defining it, you have to define an edit and save method. Um, I'll use the thing instead of just pointing. Um, and those are pretty much just React components that define the edit one, um, determines how it's going to look when you're actually editing the page. And then the same data is passed into a save method to determine what HTML is actually stored in the database um, in, the, in the post table. Um, so step three, implementing our grand plan. So our plan, ANC state blocks. That's Johannes Wolfenberg, everybody. Uh, we, 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 we've been heavy on the puns with the Gutenberg, so I hope you picked up on that and, and that you like it, because it's not going to stop. Um, so uh, we had an early start. We got started with Gutenberg development about six months ago. Um, and at that time, there were not many tools available for Gutenberg. Um, and it, it still doesn't have that many, but there's more now. Um, and so there, the documentation was there, but was sometimes scarce or out of date. Um, so we used that. Um, we relied on the community. There were blog posts written that sort of broke stuff down. And so we definitely relied on that. That was great. Um, thanks to the WordPress community for that. Um, but also, there was a lot of things that were there in Gutenberg, but weren't documented. So we really spent a lot of time looking at the source code, seeing how they were writing the core Guten blocks under the hood, and sort of figuring out how we could steal their code uh, to do other stuff. Um, so it was sort of us just banging around in the dirt, um, trying to figure out how we could advance and, and learn agriculture, I guess. Um, uh, ba, ba, ba. So our dev process is uh, sort of a timey, wimey, wibbly, wobbly uh, stack. So like we said before, Node was mostly just CSS preprocessing. So we really had to look at our stack and modernize that um, to you know, start including you know, our package JSON, defining those scripts that we're using to do things to have a common um, uh, process. Um, using Node.js, Webpack, and React and JSX, you know, JavaScript-heavy tools, um, you know, incorporating build processes um, to actually build stuff, which means that there's going to be less of that live fixes to the template when things are on the cPanel server. Um, because you know, whereas editing you know, something in PHP while it's live, I can be reasonably comp uh, com comfortable that I'm not going to totally white screen the site. And if I do, I can fix that. Whereas with your, if you're looking at like built JavaScript, there's it is very difficult to look at that and then make a change you want to change. Um, so we really had to uh, modernize our stuff and, and come up with a better process to sort of see those problems before they made it to production um, with more thorough testing of our code. Um, and so uh, if you have used React at all, um, you may be familiar with the concept of components. Um, but if you're not familiar with React, um, the idea is components are sort of these um, modular little blocks that you can add that um, have the same functions. And so it, it's very much a part of um, React development to have these parts you can build a site with, put together, um, sort of like Lego blocks. Um, but it's less, less, it was less of a paradigm in classic WordPress development. Um, it was more along the lines of we might write something that would work in one template, and then if it, we liked it, we would copy and paste that sprintf function to another template, and it was sort of, we'd have to go back and make changes. Um, but with um, templates, you can keep it dry, don't repeat yourself, um, and use the same thing in multiple places so that if you change it in one place, it's going to get updated elsewhere as well. Um, so that makes it really easy to build new blocks and let us build um, you know, common campus um, components. You know, like um, inside Gutenberg, you can have uh, you know, different controls. And one of those controls for default blocks is something like the background color. And so we could you know, have our own special component that automatically feeds in those NC State background colors um, so that we keep it on brand and we can reuse those same elements in different blocks uh, easily. Um, so. Um, so within our Gutenberg development, we didn't want to just think about um, blocks that we wanted to build. We wanted to think about with core instead. So within the core blocks, you get um, what is called a quote block, but you also get a cool quote block. What's the difference? We don't know. It just it seems to be confusing because they both serve the same purpose and they look almost identical. So those are some of the things we were thinking about. Do we want to actually remove some of these blocks for our clients to help make the transition easier? There are also blocks um, that come within the core blocks called verse, and that's for mainly if you write musical lyrics or poetry. That's not really something that happens on campus within our campus site, so that might be a block that we wanted to turn off. Um, we were also thinking about <clears throat> how we needed to incorporate, incorporate the um, NCSU brand 
not just to the block that we built, but the default core block. So we're thinking about applying filters to change and maybe having to add some CSS to make the default blocks accommodate our brand. Let's see if I can do it. Yes, nailed it. Um, so up here you see an example of, oh God, we're gonna get to heavy lift. I'm gonna try to use the laser. All right, so you see here, this is um, a heading and then you have a button. These are all default that come in the core blocks. And what we did was we added some CSS so these would render um, within our brand standards. And one of our brand standards is um, NC State is against border radius. <laughs> For your radius, not now, not ever, not with green eggs, not with ham, not with cat, none of that. So we had to remove all of the border radius, so that's one of the things we did. We also have a set of premium fonts that we always use, so we want to incorporate those fonts um, with the default blocks as well. And we have some standard font sizes and overall you know, styling of our headings, so we incorporated that as well. Um, we also applied um, a filter um, to incorporate our custom color palette, our NCSU color palette to default blocks and our custom blocks. And as you can see here, um, this renders so that when you create a button, your color options for background and text color are our brand choices. And that's just to help our clients and help people using who are inside of the NCSU web space to make good brand choices and to keep things universal across campus. So, um, with that, you know, we were really excited about all the things we were doing and how we were able to incorporate the brand. So we wanted to spread the love, much like the Hobbit, they love everyone, so this OIT design. Um, so we started talking about Gutenberg and the work that we were doing at Coworking. Um, Coworking is a, on Fridays, all the web developers across campus get together, we talk about things. We hopefully share our knowledge. Um, we give each other presentations. So we started talking about Gutenberg there a lot. Um, we did some development days. Um, we made campus-wide documentation, which augmented um, the WordPress official documentation, but it made it more specific to um, how we use WordPress at NC State. Um, we also did a lot of outreach to campus. We started slowly notifying um, our clients that Gutenberg was coming and that we were changing our trainings to accommodate Gutenberg. Um, and all of that culminated into, in March, we had a big Guten day and well developers across campus came and we shared all the knowledge that we had about Gutenberg and the things that we were working on. It was really successful. Um, even web developers from our UNC sister schools came. So it was overall a good turnout and we had a good day. Um, so one of the things we were definitely thinking of when we started working on the Blocks plugin is the CSS. Um, and if you've ever worked on a larger application or a larger code base that shares CSS, it's pretty easy for that to get out of control in terms of inconsistencies and bloat and, and other issues of, of you might be redeclaring styles that have already declared. And it's sort of harder for people to be able to jump into and change things with confidence and not you know, being afraid of those unintended uh, consequences of rewriting CSS because you may not know what's relying on those um, classes. Um, so yeah, because custom, um, custom styles can get kind of hectic and yeah, reduplicate efforts. Um, we're also thinking about how, um, you know, we're developing this plugin. We want other people on campus to use it, but they may, you know, have a specific sub style for their unit or for their group and want to override um, the decisions we make um, with their own theme styles, and so we want to think how we could make it easy to override without having to use import and everything that just mucks things up. Um, and also, um, every Gutenberg block has an, it, um, an additional CSS class block, so you can add classes in there. Um, and that's the thing we are using kind of with the short codes, and so we're thinking, um, you know, what kind of classes can we have so that that additional CSS classes block can become pretty useful and allow us to make specific changes on the fly um, for certain situations that might need it that don't really need to be in part of the, um, the styling of the blocks um, on the whole. Um, so we looked at uh, utility CSS um, frameworks and eventually settled on tachyons, which I really like. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it might look kind of crazy. It's a little bit antithetical to the um, standard of semantic class names. 
in that you have um, classes that do very specific things. And so we have one main class panel heading here. So this is from one of our blocks, the panel. And so we use that class just to help other people be able to latch on to that element and override those styles or for JavaScript to grab onto. Um, and so that one's not really doing any styling, but it's just a sort of a hook. Um, and then you've got this PA3 that adds padding, uh, relative, positions at relative, um, background red, um, adds red background, white gives white text. Um, and so that is sort of, um, oops, did I do something? Oops. Okay, so uh, the classes on there, um, they sort of do very specific things, which means that you know, nobody can go crazy adding weird sizes because they have a limited set of sizes to choose from. They can only add the sizes permitted by the classes. Um, and we are using um, those components, as I mentioned earlier, so we don't have to repeat things, which means that um, you, know, you don't have to worry about having to rewrite these same classes all over the place. They're just stored inside that component. Um, we have run into some issues with Gutenberg adding its own styles. Um, you know, a single class is only so specific, and there's some cases where Gutenberg will do some things that have more specificity than a single class, which makes it hard to override. Uh, so we've run into some issues there. Um, and then also, we still need some custom classes for more advanced things like your hover states or things that are getting heavy into pseudo classes or complex things like that. So it's, it's not a complete solution. But um, so far, it's been working well for us. Um, check back in a year to see if we regret this decision. Um, but I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty excited about it. Um, so yeah, next up. Which block to make? So um, we need to figure out what block we were going to make. Um, and one of the ways that we did that was um, we looked at the way that people, specifically our clients, were using the short codes and how they were using them. And we identified a few blocks um, that were heavily used. And those were the blocks that we. Um, I'm sorry, short quotes that were heavily used, and we decided to focus specifically on creating blocks for those short, or short codes first. Um, we also want to look at, you know, possibly filling the gaps or cleaning things up, um, and things that we didn't need anymore because default blocks already covered it. We had a short code for creating um, branding for the button that I showed you previously. Well, we no longer needed that anymore because it came with um, as one of the core blocks. Um, so, this um, is a reflection of the current blocks that we have available. We have a panel, we have alerts, we have major links, we have callouts, and we have a table of contents block. Miles, I'm going to demo for you in just a minute. But under development, we are working on a directory block, which will help augment um, a directory plugin that we already use on campus. And what it does is it will pull in from anyone on campus that has um, an NCSU ID. So that's helpful. We um, make a lot of sites for departments and student organizations, and they want to pull in info or contact info um, about their members or people in the department. Um, we're also working on an RSS feed block. Um, and this one, which I'm really excited about, is helper block. Um, we're trying to introduce. And what that will do is help us when we, train, when we start to transition our clients to Gutenberg, this would be a block that um, would pop up and say, this is where the advanced settings are for a block, or this is what you can do with this block, or maybe suggest a block after someone has started making edits to a page. You might want to incorporate this, or you might want to change this and you hear about blocks. It's like Clippy for Gutenberg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're also working on um, an icon component, which we have um, in short code form right now, but it's not visual. So our, our idea is to have a visual selector for our icon, so you can select an icon block and get a preview of what that icon looks like, because we have maybe 100 icons right now, like it's a yeah. lot. Some of them are, it's also the dash yeah. icons in there yeah. and like other common icons. But it's but hard to tell from the name what you're actually going to get. So our idea was to actually give people a preview so you can see before you actually select it what the icon looks like. So with that is demo time. Yay, demo time. Okay, <laughs> so I'm going to give you a preview of our blocks that we have available. Um, oops, don't be too mean because this is still under development. 
and I'm going to do my best to show you. Um, let me do, 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 do. Um, I zoom in. Just make it a little bigger. Okay, so um, you can see up the top, that's our brand font and that title there, it's not the default. This is my title. Um, so let's look at, um, let's say we got like this call out block. Um, so here's the call out block and that's a common like element we're using across Canvas. And so with the blocks, we're able to sort of easily lay out what um, you know areas that clients can edit. And so this is a call out. Do, do, do. This is the, we know we sometimes users want to use this to a link, so we're able to easily add um, links there. And then so you, I, earlier I talked about having those sort of custom components um, that we can pull in. So here's this little area on the right hand side, you see the background color? Um, that's a component that we can pull in easily to any future block that we make to allow those brand color selectors um, so we can make sure that people can use the cool colors that they want to without um, going too crazy and picking colors of other universities. We'll also map the font size so it'll make sure that the, the text color that goes on top of that is an accessible combination um, so that it, it sort of helps users make better sites. Um, and then also, you know, having the um, different fonts available for them. Um, and then also being able to set the different heading level um, so that they can really um, have control over their site. Um, and there's different alignments and that's all good stuff. Um, so another one is the panel block. And so this is like a collapsible panel. And it has its own styles. It's pretty similar. You can nest blocks in here. Ignore my grammar. Um, and then again, it's the same color component, but I can pass a restricted number of, of colors to it that I want only for um, you know, this particular component. I can you know, change a collapsible, not collapsible. Um, then other blocks, there's a common thing you'll see across Canvas, which is these fancy links with like an arrow next to them. And that used to have to be a short code, which is, you know, you have to know what the short code is and what the parameters are, which is not always clear to end users. Um, and shortcake help with that, but I can add, this is my, this is my major link, add a link to that. Um, let's do another one. We've got an alert block that's also going to do alert thing. Nobody usually watches me when I type. Um, so yeah, it's H2. You can say it's H3. Um, and then, um, yeah, so those are fun blocks. Um, another one that it's brand new, so this may break, so bear with me if this breaks, um, but a, um, table of contents block that will automatically scan the page for the headings and, and then make a table of contents based on that. And you can use it inside the editor to actually jump to those blocks. It doesn't actually run it, render the front end now, but that's the example of sort of things we're doing that are fun tools, or not, not fun, but very actually helpful tools. <laughs> they're, fun. They're, they're fun for me to develop, but they're also incredibly useful to our clients and to campus, um, to sort of things that like previously inside of the classic editor would have been like pretty hard to do or would have been very restrictive or you would have really had to know what code you had to write to get, but it's now like pretty easy and it's right there for you. Um, so if I publish this and look at the front end, um, you can see that there's those things there. I told that panel to be collapsible and it is. There's a link. The spacing might need some playing with. I forgot to show you how cool this thing is with an image. So I can add my beautiful sunset image to that. And then, you know, left, right image, what have you, that's, that's easy to do, whereas before it would have been pretty complicated to have those options. Now, um, they're right there. So that's the NCSC Blocks plugin as it stands now, under current development, and now back to our regular programming. Um, that's the button I want. Uh, we will probably, I don't think it's on our public GitHub yet, but we'll put it there once we're sure that y'all won't laugh at it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, but yeah, we, we do intend to make that public so people can look at that and, and sort of learn from that. We're in the process of testing it out now. Yeah, it's still got some bugs we're trying to work out. Um, but yeah, so here are the, the images in case that live demo went bad. Um, but now, Guten angry. So with that,
using um, our custom block. Um, again, our main issue was lack of documentation. So the WordPress documentation for Gutenberg is not fully fleshed out, so we were doing a lot of guessing and checking, checking with each other, um, and scratching our heads, banging our heads sometimes, sometimes yelling very awful things. Um, <laughs> So situations would come up where, um, you know, as Gutenberg is an ongoing development process, things like the component names, which, which doesn't necessarily break our blocks, but it makes us have to be on our toes constantly for when they update things um, and change the name of things. Um, an example of that was there used to be um, a component which is called Edible, and it became um, the rich text, and it will like within an update, so that made us have to switch gears and figure out how to incorporate that instead of the edible form. Um, also, there were just weird changing locations of methods and how they did things with them, um, having ongoing development and rearranging their code. So we also had to look out for that as well. And again, because of lack of documentation, it was hard to know, is this a bug? Because they're working on this too, or are we just messing it up? <coughs> Usually it was a little bit of both, maybe a lot of us messing it up. <laughs> um, but with that came a lot of uh, block validation issues. And block validation issues is essentially when your block breaks, and it usually breaks because you've made some kind of update or change to it, and it's already currently available. And that can include changing, you know, basically anything, but mainly like if you change an attribute when you're building your block, and then while it's already made, then it will render your block. And then there was some documentation on this deprecation process that you have to use when order you want to update an existing block. But it wasn't fully fleshed out. So we're still kind of trying to work that around and figure out how can we um, incorporate some things into our dev process. We found some filters that they just started talking about, which may fix our problem from breaking our block constantly when we're developing them. Um, <laughs> Made us sad sometimes because we love Gutenberg, is it? Yeah. What's it? Okay, yeah, so the future of blocks. Uh, the future of blocks is going to look like this. Skynet! Yeah. Uh, no, the future of blocks, uh, things we're looking at for in the future are um, relational or conditional blocks, blocks that are aware of the other things happening inside the page. Um, the table of contents is an example of that, um, that it's aware of those other blocks, but things where it may be... Um, you know, if, if it sees several things in a row and it, you know, it might suggest a more interesting layout for you or know, hey, you've done this, maybe you should do this next. So, um, and then also using like common uh, layouts or block templates um, so that somebody working on campus, if they need to make a page, um, we can have templates for them so they can really build something easily. And rather than having to go in there and configure that every time, it's easy for them to produce something that looks good. Um, and um, you know every everyone on campus and probably in your jobs as well is pretty busy all the time So anything we can do to develop um, tools to help our clients um, Build things quicker and empower them really is good for us. Um, we're also looking at in integrating with our ticketing system service now um, we're also looking at um, having uh, Protected content blocks so we can have blocks that encapsulate content that require you to log into view in case there's sensitive information and then also you make maybe a block that can um, a, um, connect via API to our, our library of campus stock photos to again allow people to easily build these things without having to go there and find that out on a separate web page, download that, um, it could just grab it for them and pull it in as they're building that page. Um, so there's a lot of excitement that we have towards the cool stuff we're going to be able to do in the future. And, and right now, um, you know, sort of those are the ideas I have, but I, I, we're also pretty excited for like what ideas the community is going to come up with um, as Gutenberg development, you know, builds off of itself and we see what the future has to offer. Um, so step four is maintaining. Uh, and this is really a big question mark because we're still in the process. We're really still in the implementing phase and maybe the planning phase. Um, so this is a big question mark, like who knows what's going to happen. Is our, our the, the, thing, the, the decisions we've made with CSS, is that going to come back to bite us? You know, those block validation issues, are we going to find a way to work around those? Um, you know, what's going to change? You know, what, what is it actually going to be like when it's in the hands of, you know, thousands of people across campus? Um, so that's a big question for us. So that's pretty much it, but the key takeaway so far 
in our process is Gutenberg was pretty big and scary and terrifying, and it still is, but it's also been a great opportunity to sort of refine our development process and our collaboration as a team. So it's be really been a helpful catalyst for us to tr kind of refine and update our dev process. So it's been really great in that regard. Um, so some resources. Um, up at the top there, we have the, our, the documentation we've been working on for Canvas for Gutenberg. Um, it's there. Um, also, the um, Gutenberg Handbook. And again, these slides are at go.ncsu. Go.ncsu.edu slash blockenspiel are these slides. That's S-P-I-E-L. Mm -hmm. um, German, it sounds like the... The second letter, whatever. Uh, and then the Gutenberg Handbook, which has the documentation Gutenberg has so far. Uh, we've also been working, I made a block that automatically checks all the blocks you have installed on an instance. And we'll, we'll pull those attributes, which is helpful for building block templates. So you can look at those there. And then also that code is available on GitHub now um, at that link there. Um, then also check out the WordPress GitHub repo, um, the main one, and read the source code. Also, we heavily, like our blocks plugin and, and other random blocks we've been making, rely heavily on the Create Guten Block um, package, scaffolding. yeah, scaffolding tool, um, which is available there on GitHub. That's super helpful if you're starting to get working with Gutenberg development. Um, pick up Create Guten Block. If you've ever used Create React app, it's similar to that. It's going to configure Webpack for you. It's going to do a lot of the hard stuff so you can get straight to writing the code. And so that's been a big development help for us. And, and I think it will be for you as well. Um, now, uh, if you have any questions, um, we can talk about that now. Also, though, we have a sandbox for the front end if you want to play around with our blocks at go.ncsu.edu slash block dash sandbox. Um, but yeah, any, any questions for us? Sure. Uh, what, what happens is, so like the, the Gutenberg will validate the block. So if you open up a page that's that's been saved in Gutenberg, it's gonna it's gonna take that HTML that you've saved, um, and then it's going to um, when you define the block, you define like those attributes that are saved, and so it's going to pull those attributes out of the code, run it back through your save function, and then it's gonna compare that HTML that it gets with what HTML you already had, and if it doesn't match up, it's gonna say this block is invalid, um, and then in some cases it'll be able to recover, in other cases not. So it, it, it will, yeah, like basically like delete the button or it might, you might have to convert it to a custom HTML block. Um, yeah, but... Uh, there is not yet, no, there's nothing like that. That's, yeah, we wish. That's the thing we've been looking at the block filters that might enable us to like sort of tell it to just not mind so much if it's invalid. Um, but that that mostly happens like with if, like we're editing a block, so I make version of a block and then I make an update and then it sees it's invalid because it's changed. Um, so that's going to be a challenge for us definitely as we roll out and, and change unless we write all of our blocks perfectly the first time. So that's our goal. But. Yeah. Yeah. We, I don't. We've not success. So there is a way to say like, okay, here's the old code. Like, if you see this, that's okay. Just transform it this way. Um, we've not successfully done that yet to get that work. But theoretically, like that is the thing is that you just keep those old versions in the code. Um, but you know, we're kind of worried that you know, what if you end up with hundreds of old versions in there? Do you want to keep all that if you're using components in those blocks? then you also have to keep all the old versions of the components in there and rebuild that tree. And so there's sort of these rolling questions. Um, right there? So am I understanding correctly that Gutenberg doesn't affect the simulation? No, yeah. So if you, if you like turn on Gutenberg, if you were to install the plugin now or when WordPress 5.0 comes out, um, you can turn um, Gutenberg on and it will um, 
it, it won't change anything on the front end until you've edited it. Yeah. At the very back. Plugins out there just yet. Doing blocky. Doing yeah, doing blocky time. Um, I just I wasn't sure whether like yeah. old ones would create conflicts with the new. It's it's possible, but we haven't run into any of the regular plugins that we use. We haven't had any plugin interference in that regard. I well, have that's been, very good news because I'm from UNC and we use very good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, like if you're using page building plugins, I don't know what's going to happen there with Gutenberg, but that's, you know, yeah. that's crazy anyways. Okay. Um, I'm not a coder, by any means, but mm -hmm. I'm trying to get my mind around this. Is, from what I've seen, you're using this more or less as a page builder? Yes. Does, does it go beyond that? or Because it looks great the way that you're using it, but is that basically the intent of being able to give people more ability to yeah, basically it is, it's a page builder. It's sort of a, instead of sort of using advanced custom fields or other page builders, um, we're all sort of centralized around um, Gutenberg now. Um, so yeah, it's a page builder. Um, there's rumors and like vague blog posts by the people who develop WordPress that it's gonna be something more and take over more of the theme process. Um, something like that, who knows what's gonna happen. But right now it basically exists as a page builder. Um, so, it, the, so the front end is, um, is not powered by React at all. So the React is the editing interface. And so it, will, it saves the content though as HTML um, in the database and that's what's output to the screen. Um, so it won't, um, I, I, I think that the caching plugin should all still work because those all are based off the front end content which is still just static HTML. And I imagine the image optimization will work the same way where it's, it's not really interacting with that much. Um, unless you're doing stuff on the, the admin dashboard side with the page editing. Um, yeah, so I think that it, you know, those caching plugins should still continue to work fine. Same with image optimization. We're happy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Are you, you guys happy? We're happy. Yes. We're happy that we started early. And even with those changes, just because there are so many things that we need to do to get this front end, like we need to start over. And we're happy. And some of the changes and updates kind of suck. But a lot of times they're better. A lot of times they're better. Um, and then if it sucks, you just wait because usually someone else thinks it's No, I mean, like, the most, there's been not that many, like, actual breaking changes. And so, I mean, there's probably been some, like, things that, like, I learned that are no longer relevant. But for the most part, it's, it's, it, we've been glad that m m enough of it has stayed the same, that definitely um, the stuff we've learned is helpful in sort of getting on board with it and sort of being able to dive deep over the time has been helpful. So I would definitely say jump on board now. Um, yeah. Okay. About that. Yes. <laughs> so Jen and I will be giving a session yes. all about that. Every year, yeah. Yeah. But the but the the, the too long and read is uh, definitely not before Gutenberg, you know, in five zero, not before five zero. Yeah, we we have some sites that are live using it now. 
um, for like places that we're really heavily into and, and sort of have more control over. And so, I mean, in some ways, we're already using it. But yeah, I mean, we'll listen to their talk about more. But um, we do have a plan, and it's going to be a long process. Yeah. Um, but definitely check out the Create Good block, because um, that sort of sets everything up for you. And Create React apps the same way. Yeah. But definitely a foundation in JavaScript is going to be super helpful. Um, it, it, um, that'll depend on the environment. I mean, I think that it's, it's going to roll out, probably not as a must-use plugin, um, but, but as, as an option like network available for people to, to turn on. Um, I think that most of like most of our development, like any step for us making into CI, is going to involve turning it on. Um, but like for places that places where we're more backup and they may manage their own thing, that'll be kind of optional for them. I don't think we're going to force anyone to use it. But we think it's going to be helpful enough that if somebody like has an issue, you know, we're not going to we're going to say you know first step you know try and do something, turn on in state blocks plugin. So that is an ongoing discussion in the WordPress community. And you are not the first one to coin that the classic editor. There is a, uh, so, so there is, um, right now, Gutenberg is a, exists as a plugin. Uh, when 5.0 launches, they are, well, so also now there's a classic editor plugin. And so that will be a plugin you'll be able to have in your site and install that. And that'll have the classic editor basically be available to you. Now, um, they've said that they will continue to support the classic editor for a while. What does that mean? Um, who knows? Um, some people, you know, people like relying heavily on page builders are grumbling and say, we're going to fork WordPress. Is that going to happen? Who knows? And so it's sort of unclear. I'm sure there will be people who never try and upgrade to Gutenberg. I'm sure there'll be people who get fed up and leave the WordPress community. Um, Any, any other questions? Sure. Um, early, early on when you were kind of introducing what you guys were building, you had a set number of themes that you already rolled out and pushed out. Mm -hmm. Are you envisioning like forking those for Gutenberg, or are you creating new things that say one of your end goals? Um, so that's um, sort of a, um, a question. So Gutenberg, I mean, really, it just populates. Like in, in the past, you might have a, a, the, the content function. Right. And so like as long as that still works, like that's going to work. So for our, our main plugin, Hillsboro, or our main theme, Hillsboro, that a lot of our clients are on, that's kind of a minimalist theme. And so that is sort of, I mean, we're making enhancements to that. Brian's making enhancements to that just so it'll work with Gutenberg and sort of enable some options. But at this point, it doesn't really require a whole rewrite of that, rewrite of that theme. It's going to be the same theme. Now, in other cases, um, there's another one we work with, Polton, and, and Kim, my main clients here, who uses that plugin. Um, that will probably require more major rewrites of that plugin because it relies heavily on advanced custom fields and, and d a little bit. So <laughs> some, some templates do. So like if, you're, if your theme templates are like calling, you know, get field and stuff, and there's a lot of stuff in there, that I'm will, ACF, so. yeah, so if, if you're heavy into ACF, that probably will require like a very advanced rewrite because, you know, you're not using the post meta to pull stuff in anymore. It's all coming from the content. Um, so it, it really depends on where your existing theme is now. Mm -hmm. uh, we bought the lifetime subscription, so we can use it forever. As a client of like the theme producer, should we all be expecting this these lifetime subscriptions? 
suggestions to be auto updated to cloud compatible, or should we be looking at possibly having a rebuy in our team? Well, now, yeah. where's my, where's they're my supposedly yeah. working on it. Yeah, I mean, they're working on it. Yeah. Their whole business model is built on page builders, and so like they're not. I assume they're not going to let their company just wither and die. Um, so, but but it, I mean, it's hard to say. Like, what are they going to do? You know, their whole business model is page builders, and when page builders in WordPress core, you know, what are they doing as a value add? So, I would be very surprised if they don't make it compatible with WordPress 5.0. But um, but then it sort of becomes like, what's the value add of that thing? So personally, I would, you know. Like right now, Divi is like kind of proprietary, and if you want something to work with Divi, it has to work with Divi. Um, and so, like, is that going to be the case in the future, where like using Divi is going to lock you into Divi? Then you might want to look at doing something else that's not so proprietary. But if they build it in open a way that's going to integrate with other WordPress like Gutenberg specific plugins, um, you're going to have to look at you know how well that's integrating with your theme. Um, so. Yeah, so yeah, check out what they're saying. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Um, most of the stuff, like our main themes, are custom written. I, sometimes, like, units will come to us on campus, they'll do their own thing and buy a theme and be using that, and then they'll come to us and they want you know, support and help, um, in which case, like, we may inherit those and be using those, and those are purchased. Um, but most of the projects we try and put into our um, Hillsborough theme, which is custom built. Can you just have the link for these slides again? Uh, yes. <laughs> there. Thank you. Uh, I think, are, are we out of time yet? I don't know. Yeah, we're out of time. Okay. Thank you. If you have more questions, uh, Miles and Lauren, would you?